Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming along for this um, special inorganic lunchtime talk. So we're here to mark the contributions um, to the School of Chemistry and to the wider chemical community um, made by Cooper Hepstein and Dave Garner over their careers. Um, on a personal level, both Dave and Peter um, have been great mentors to me over the two years that I, I've been here, um, and they'll both be missed when they, when they leave. Um, and as Peter is retiring um, over the summer, I thought I'd just like to say how much he will be missed by the School of Chemistry. Um, and in particular, if he wants to come back and do some second year undergraduate <laughs> Death lectures, um, I'd be more than happy to try and raise that one. <laughs> um, when I was asked to do this, and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to do it, um, I wondered uh, what sort of approach I should make. And so I decided in the end that rather than having a, an academic sort of lecture, that what we would do is we would have a, a, a trip down memory lane. So I'm really reminiscing here. And I apologize, really, because it's a personal reminiscence. The title I came up with eventually was, as you can see here, from energy generation, associated with nuclear energy, uh, through to energy generation, which is associated with hydrogen energy. And then in between, well, there was energy generation again, but in this case, it was associated with biological energy. So that seemed to me to be the, the three aspects to the work that I've actually been carrying out over the last, I don't quite remember how many years. I think it was very much a serendipitous journey that I've taken. Uh, I've come across rather a lot of fortunate occurrences. And I think the point about that is the fact that you have to take advantage of all the opportunities that actually arise to you. So, there I am, um, a young uh, version of me and a slightly older version of me. That w must have been in 1968, as Illich said, that's when I uh, graduated with a PhD. And that was not very long ago when I was enjoying myself in um, Singapore. As Illich said, uh, I did my undergraduate uh, degree here and Thinking about 1965 reminds me of one of the most traumatic occasions that I've ever had to experience. And that was the fact that I was given an oral exam and to determine the actual standard of degree. And I remember very, very vividly that the three guys opposite, who all seemed to be very aged, I'm sure they, they wouldn't do it now to me, but they did at the time, one of them started to talk about phosphorus oxyacids and wanted to know what I knew about them. Well, the point was I knew absolutely nothing about them. And uh, from that point onwards, um, my, uh, my standing as far as those three were concerned actually went to an absolute minimum, and I've never, ever been interested in the phosphorus oxy acids ever since. <laughs> so um, I was here uh, for uh, a total of seven years doing uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, and uh, uh, when I first decided to do a PhD, in, uh, this, despite the fact that I didn't do particularly well in that oral exam, Cliff Addison was quite happy to take me on. But in those days, you didn't have much choice as to what you did. You were told, this is where you're going, and this is the lab you're going to work in, and this is the topic on which you're going to work. And I was uh, <coughs> told I was going to work on liquid metals. This is a picture of Cliff Addison, uh, who was the uh, inorganic professor from 19... 48 through to 1978, 30 years uh, when he actually looked after the department. And I found his obituary in The Independent, which was written by Norman Greenwood. You know the Greenwood of Greenwood and Earnshaw. And there's a couple of uh, points that I want to bring out. One was that uh, he says Addison's own group concentrated on the perhaps initially surprising choice of the extremely reactive liquid compound, dinitrogen tetroxide, as a solvent medium for chemical reactions. And I know that Dave, in fact, was very much involved as a uh, PhD student and as a postdoc on that part of uh, Addison's interests. The other aspect of interest was, in fact, uh, liquid metals. And uh, the obituary goes on to say he also initiated work in an even more demanding field, the chemistry of al liquid alkaline metals, such as sodium and potassium. This is a veritable tour de force of technical virtuosity. And I must admit, I agree with him entirely, having been involved in that for some considerable time. 
So why was he interested in liquid metals? Well, he was an, an inorganic chemist. He was interested in non-aqueous solvents. And the opportunity came to look at liquid metals as solvents because of interest from the UK AEA, the UK Atomic Energy Authority, that was at that stage trying to develop the fast breeder reactor and needed a very efficient coolant system. And they were looking at the use of liquid metals and particularly uh, relatively light liquid metals and they were looking at sodium and sodium and potassium alloys. So Addison was quite interested in this as a uh, annex to his interest in non-aqueous solvents and we uh, in fact set off to look at these. At the time I started in 65, in fact there were three aspects to inorganic chemistry which were non-aqueous solvents. There's N204 which was being run by Norman Logan there's the liquid alkaline metals, which was Dick Pullum, as uh, Illich has mentioned, and Martin Barker. Martin, of course, is no longer with us, but uh, Norman and Dick still are. And there's also uh, another guy who was even dafter than the rest of us, and he was looking at HF, and that was Mike Dove. And Mike Dove still exists to tell the tale. So, um, basically, why should we want to use liquid metals as solvents? And is there a problem associated with them? There certainly is a problem. And the problem is, how do you actually follow reactions in liquid alkaline metals? You can't use spectroscopy, you can't use things like electrochemistry, magnetic chemistry. These are all not possible. And we have to look at alternatives. One thing that was suggested to me when we started was, why don't we use whole effect measurements? Well, I hadn't a clue what whole effect measurements were. Um, but I did, in fact, look into it and decided that was only a possibility. But the other possibility was, in fact, using resistivity measurements. And that, I decided, was going to be quite a, a, a fruitful way of uh, studying these uh, systems. Why would, did I think that was going to be fruitful? Well, it's because you can actually monitor composition data uh, for uh, a solute dissolved in the liquid metal simply by monitoring the resistivity of the metal. As you increase the amount of impurity or solute in your liquid metal, then basically the resistivity goes up. So it's possible to monitor concentrations in that way. And there are a number of different scenarios that you can think of. You can think of different sorts of so uh, solutes, soluble solutes, um, and insoluble solutes. And you can get a different number of scenarios, as I've said. And you can actually monitor the sort of chemistry that's going on. This was all uh, very much in the uh, future, as far as I was concerned, where we're going to be able to do this. Because, of course, we had no equipment. We were starting from scratch. So the first thing to do was to design a resistivity cell. And this was the original one, very simple one. And the idea was that you actually filled the uh, reservoir at the left-hand side with your liquid metal, perhaps with the solute in, in there. And then you evacuated the whole system. The argon that was in the uh, narrow pipe uh, was evacuated. Then you put a pressure of argon back in the system and you filled the pipe. Of course, you then did your temperature measurements, resistivity measurements as a function of temperature. But the problem with this, of course, is the fact that it's a one-off experiment. You can only get one set of data for this. So this looks as if it's going to be really tedious, uh, trying to get lots of information about uh, liquid metals using this technique. It didn't look very thought, very promising. But then, in a discussion uh, with Dick Pullum, we worked out, or he particularly worked out, a method of actually pumping metals around a circuit. And we simply used Fleming's left-hand rule. So if you apply a current uh, uh, across a system that's actually sitting in a magnetic field, then the metal is constrained to move. And so if the metal is liquid, the metal will move. And so this was a means of actually changing the composition of the metal or the uh, solution inside the resistance, resistivity measurement section. Our problem, initial problem, was the fact that uh, if one's going to do this, then basically you need to measure the resistance across this section here. And we were very concerned about measuring the resistance over this section, because this is going to be variable depending on what's going on at this part, where you're actually cir cir circulating the metal into the, uh, the main part of the vessel. So what we had to do was we had to have this section across here had to be non-conducting. So we devised this rather intricate method of having two blaster metal seals. Those of you that are old enough will be able to remember what a blaster metal seal was or is. 
Uh, there we were actually put uh, back to back, and that meant that we had an insulating section here. So any resistance measurement across here was simply the resistance measurement across that section. But the problem was that the liquid metal uh, always ended up attacking the glass and metal seal. And so within uh, three or four days of uh, experimentation, the whole thing fell apart and uh, <coughs> one had to start afresh. The answer to this problem is so simple, it's amazing that it took us a long time to work it out. But the answer is very simple, and it was thought of by another PhD student in the lab. And this is, I think, a message that is important, and it's something associated with this sort of lecture. Not the, the, not the lecture that Dave and I are giving, but the ones that we normally have on a um, uh, lunchtime. And that is, other people have good ideas, and it's worthwhile listening to them and relating them to your own topic. Because Pete Sim came up with the very simple system of actually just running the pipe through the uh, measuring section uh, in both directions. A really elegant, very simple um, method. And it solved all our problems. That, and from that point onwards, we could actually do enormous amounts of, uh, of uh, work on these systems. So we're indebted very much to Pete Sim for thinking of that. And as I do say, it is important that one takes these occasions seriously because there are opportunities to learn as we come across other, um, perhaps what apparently may appear to be quite different <coughs> uh, pieces of work. So eventually we, we de developed this system to a this situation where we could actually sell resistivity uh, monitors, and we were selling them to the uh, European Union, where they were working with uh, liquid metals and monitoring compositions. So we eventually managed to hone this to a quite a, a very fine level. Anybody from B21? No one from B21? Do you recognize it? That's B21 in 1966. 768. Um, that was one of Addison's labs. And there is uh, my oven. That's only a small one. It only went to 300 degrees. And also, that shows the other oven, which went up to about 500 degrees centigrade. And basically, the liquid metals group were in B21 and B31 in those days. And the liquid N204, they were in B19 and B29. Is that right, Dave? Uh, and so that I thought it would be interesting to, uh, to show you those photographs. Dick Pullum insisted that I took those photographs, uh, or had them taken, I should say, and put in my thesis. So that's uh, a, a record which is uh, uh, unfortunate to have, actually, because I would never have done that if Dick hadn't have insisted. So that's the resistivity change on addition of bearing to liquid sodium, which was the topic that I was asked to look at. Addison had asked me to look at that topic because the product of the reaction of barium with dinitrogen in liquid sodium was, in fact, Ba2N, very strange product, uh, not Ba3N2, which was the predicted product. And so he was interested in knowing exactly what was happening in the solution. So we managed to get some uh, resistivity data uh, and ultimately, we also used a, an alternative method of monitoring these systems, which was to monitor the resistivity as a function of temperature, not as a concentration, but as a function of temperature. And there's a, a number of uh, isocompositional experiments here showing how you can actually determine phase diagram data from resistivity data. And that uh, leads to all sorts of interesting information. And ultimately, we were able to sort out the system, but it was in 1994 that this paper was actually published. So again, there's a message here, you know, if it doesn't work, first of all, try again um, and make uh, lots of efforts, because it, ultimately you will be successful. So going back to my uh, history, in 1969 I went to uh, Brookhaven on, on Long Island, and there's a proof of me uh, being there. Uh, in the lab, and uh, I was in 
part of the applied science uh, group there. And what I was doing was I was looking at safety studies in liquid alkali metals, particularly liquid sodium. So again, it was associated with the liquid metal fast breeder reactor programs. I did thermodynamics there, so I learned a lot in uh, going to Brookhaven. I learned a lot uh, theoretically about uh, thermodynamics and a lot about manipulation of liquid metals as well. And whilst I was there, I in fact managed to do some work, publishable work, on solutions of tin and lead in liquid sodium. These, I'm afraid, are not very good pictures, but they're the best I could manage from some slides that I had, which were made by BNL whilst I was there, showing uh, the uh, variation of activities as a function of composition and also uh, information about phase diagram data. So uh, whilst I was there, I learned a lot. And again, I think it's important that uh, we recognize that going to... Um, other, play, other institutions actually is a very valuable way of uh, increasing your experience and is a, a very useful way of developing your, your CV. But not only did I learn a little bit about um, thermodynamics and liquid metals, but I also learned about volleyball. As you can see there, we were the great victors of the uh, volleyball. I don't think I contributed very much, actually, because I don't think I was particularly good at volleyball. I seem to end up on the floor all the time. Um, but uh, the other guys were, were pretty good. So we uh, won the, uh, the BNL trophy. But at the same time, I also managed to keep uh, my soccer interests going. And um, uh, I just might identify one or two particular <laughs> sections of this, uh, where it says, uh, five minutes before time, a rejuvenated BNL team went ahead. When, oh! Obviously, lobbed the ball over the patch of goalkeeper's head from long range. What a great goal. <laughs> ah, yes, a few minutes later, centre from the right was volleyed home by you-know-who in fine style. Ah, ah, a goal from a corner. And then, goodness gracious, the referee doesn't know what he's talking about because it would appear that in this particular case, the ball went in, but the referee disagreed and dis disallowed the goal. So <laughs> I had a great time, actually. The, the problem was no one over there, well, the great thing from my point of view was that although I was no good at soccer, I was better than they were because they were, you know, the, the numbers of people playing soccer was very limited. So I could make a considerable contribution. So there we are. I came back to Nottingham, uh, part of the academic staff, and we started to look at, use the resistivity method a little bit more extensively. and. Uh, you can take um, uh, some chromium, uh, put it into liquid lithium. It won't dissolve. It just still sits there. And then you can add dinitrogen to the system, and the dinitrogen will be absorbed, and it will react with the chromium to form Li9CRN5. So you, you can see how one can actually monitor these reactions occurring in the uh, liquid metal. You can also look at kinetics. As I can see there, by addition of the the nitrogen, the resistivity went up, and then it slowly came back down again as the nitrogen reacted with the chromium present in the liquid metal. Oh, there's another um, picture. Um, at this stage, obviously, I was still interested in soccer, but, of course, coming back to England, I couldn't really get much of a game, ever, so I had to put up with just the staff games. And this is the staff in 1975 about to play... Uh, the students. We always had a regular staff student game in those days. And I don't know if you can recognize anybody on there. Anybody recognize anybody that's still uh, commonly in the department, apart from me? You'll recognize me, I assume. I'm the captain, by the way, with the football. Anybody recognize anybody? Lives next door to me in my office? Next door to my office? You're right. You're right, yes. Professor Chapman has worked out that uh, it's Jerry on the uh, far left. <laughs> you don't believe me? It is. <laughs> and then um, on the back row again, those of you that remember George Davidson, he's third from the right. And Phil Harrison is uh, second from the right. But that was in uh, 1975 when we played the students. I don't think we won. Uh, so uh, 
We used to have Dan Ely refereeing. Do, some of you will remember Dan Ely, and uh, he always um, uh, seemed to err on the side of the uh, staff, which was a, a good thing because it meant that we had a, a reasonable chance of winning. Okay, so um, uh, uh, there's another experiment here, a resistivity experiment, where we took uh, carbon and uh, reacted it with dinitrogen in liquid lithium, and we came out with a product of Li2NCN, uh, a stoichiometry of two nitrogens to one carbon. And eventually, we were able to actually crystallize Li2NCN in li from liquid lithium. And I think this is the first crystal structure that I ever did. And uh, basically, uh, <coughs> we managed to, uh, to get this particular compound. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we were actually not to, to simply consider it to be a product from liquid uh, alkaline metals, but to look at the chemistry of this species. Uh, and so I thought, well, what we ought to do then is we ought to get some cyanamide and start reacting it with the uh, alkaline metals. So I did that, but the problem was that cyanamide on standing forms its dimer, cyanoguanidine. And when you react that with alkaline metals, for example, potassium dissolved in, uh, in ethanol, you end up with a potassium salt of cyanoguanidine, not the uh, product that you expect, which is a potassium salt of uh, uh, cyanamide. But that was interesting because it made me think about going on to further steps, and that was to go on to look at cyanoguanidine with uh, transition metal cations rather than with alkaline metal cations. And this was the first product that we got, and it was with copper one. And as you can see, it's a, it's a di-copper compound, and at that point... Um, we realized that, in fact, the dinuclear copper cis complex is reminiscent of the active center of hemocyanin. So this is, brings us around to the biological energy, where we're talking about uh, the method of transporting dioxygen around uh, arthropods. And the uh, active uh, center is a di-copper system in this uh, protein hemocyanin. And so... Uh, we looked at this, there's a, a picture of, um, of hemocyanin, and we realized that the separation between the two copper centers is in fact uh, about 3.7 angstroms, 3.8 or 3.6, depending on whether you've got oxygen there or not. And so we thought, well, 5.05 is a little bit far away, can we actually uh, get it, uh, any closer? But before I do that, I thought I ought to uh, have a, a couple of pictures actually showing uh, an example of an arthropod, this is in fact the horseshoe crab. And this uh, horseshoe crab is in fact at Langkawi in Malaysia. And uh, I think the next, th there's me very gingerly, <laughs> very, very gingerly holding this, uh, this crab. And uh, this little girl has no problems at all in holding this. She's quite happy about it. So um, there we were actually uh, looking at these prehistoric uh, crabs in, uh, in Malaysia. So I went to great lengths to get some real photographs of these, uh, these species. So if we're going to get to something a little bit shorter, the separation, we need something more like 3.7 angstroms. Perhaps pyridazine would do that for us. And indeed, we did, in fact, do some work with pyridazine, and we got a, a, a bi two binuclear compounds, one of which was a bisbridge pyridazine compound, one of which was a trisbridge pyridazine compound. The bisbridge pyridazine compound was very interesting because we actually did some experiments with Mike George. Is Mike here? No, Mike's not here. Uh, Mike George and um, Paul Walton, who was a research student at that time. And we took the, uh, the Bisbridge complex and we uh, treated it with uh, dioxygen. And uh, when we added the dioxygen, certainly the colour of the solution changed quite considerably. It went from a sort of a pale brown colour to a, a dirty brown colour. So we felt there was uh, obviously something, some reaction was occurring. And rather fortunately, we were able to do some UV visible experiments. So we were able to show that on absorption and desorption, and this was a process that could be carried out several times, you could actually see the changes that were occurring on the addition of uh, dioxygen and removal of dioxygen from the system. Unfortunately, Paul Walton was the only one that was able to do this experiment. I spent probably three years afterwards with another research student looking at this, a very, very able research student, but it was never possible to, uh, uh, to repeat it. 
So we've, um, it's always been on the back burner. So we went on further and we thought, well, perhaps it would be easier if we were to take the pyridazine and sort of anchor our copper centers in place using this uh, tetradentate ligand. But the problem was that we didn't get the product we were expecting. The product was this molecule here. But this, in fact, was quite interesting because, in fact, it's a trinuclear system. And trinuclear systems do occur in, in biology. And it was reminiscent of the active center of a sorbate oxidase. There are some pictures of a sorbate oxidase showing the trinuclear center. And the comparison between our complex and the uh, uh, active center in a sorbate oxidase is there. This reminds me very much of how uh, fortunate we one is to, uh, in many respects, to be able to do chemistry that sort of evolves. And in many respects, uh, finding that, I saw that, that trinuclear center was totally unexpected. It was very serendipitous. And that's why I've got this picture here, because I do a lot of orienteering, as many of you will realize. And orienteering involves running around forests or moors uh, looking for red and white uh, markers and um, more often than not uh, rather than actually being able to navigate properly to the uh, red and white markers one sort of rushes along for uh, uh, perhaps half a kilometre or so and then stands, scratches your head and eventually uh, walk around around in circles and you fall into the uh, site where the, the marker is located. Very serendipitous. So I thought there was a very good relationship between my chemistry and my orienteering ability. Ah, by the way, you'll be very pleased to learn that not last weekend, but the previous weekend, I actually entered the NOC, that's the Nottinghamshire Orienteering Com uh, Club's um, orienteering competition for the, uh, for the annual competition, and I came first. I'm actually the champion. No, 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 no. There's only two of us entered. <laughs> And the other guy, he can't run, so he has to walk around. <laughs> we do it on an age basis, so uh, there was only two of us that were 65 plus. Although I'm not really 65 yet, not quite. That's coming next month. So, but we, we're like horses in orienteering. We change age uh, as, as you would change the year. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there we are. Okay, so uh, could we actually get to the... the uh, desired binuclear compound by reduction of copper 2. Remember, we got the trinuclear compound from the uh, other experiment. So we actually uh, prepared a, um, a copper 2 species. And you can, in fact, get copper 2 species. But, the, but they're always uh, linked by an anion. And the anion normally is the hydroxide anion. And when you actually treat it with um, uh, Asorbic acid, unfortunately what happens is that uh, you don't, the whole thing uh, falls apart and you tend to form uh, these aggregates, these tetrameric aggregates. So this, this is a sort of sink in the system. So that was rather disappointing. Uh, but we also realized that it's possible to look at other uh, proteins and enzymes and uh, nitrite reductase in fact is a dinuclear <coughs> copper species. And that is a system where the two copper centers are actually quite well separated. And so we looked into the possibility of looking at some different compounds where we uh, formed the binuclear copper center but had different separations. And you can do different separations using these types of ligands, uh, pyrazine, 4,4 bipyridine, and so on and so forth. And uh, in fact, we were able to make uh, some... Uh, <coughs> dinuclear systems, but unfortunately what also happened was that you tended to form chains as well. It's very, very difficult to stop chains from forming in these systems. And eventually we did in fact work uh, out that by using appropriate uh, blocking ligands, chelating ligands, tridentic chelating ligands, you could in fact prevent chain formation. But the chain formation was good because it led us into another uh, form of chemistry and that was in fact um, formation of um, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional structures. And I think the most attractive one-dimensional compound that we formed was this silver compound, with this, uh, uh, which is, in fact, a spiral staircase structure. And this occurred just as Martin Schroeder came 
to the, uh, to the school. So this will be uh, oh, about 15 years ago where we were looking at this type of material. And uh, <coughs> at that stage, I became more involved with Neil and also with Martin in terms of the uh, three-dimensional matrix formation. But not only can we make one-dimensional change, but we can make two-dimensional sheets, as many of you are aware. And you can have these sheets uh, coordinately linked or hydrogen bondedly linked. We can also make three-dimensional compounds. And depending on the metal centre, you can determine the actual three-dimensional structure. So four connected systems, of course, will give rise to diamond-type uh, structures. Six connected octahedral systems will give you the alpha polonium structure and eight connected uh, systems, which are cubic, will in fact give you body-centered cubic type topologies. So this is this, this sort of third aspect where we're talking about the hydrogen economy, the uh, generation of energy using, uh, using hydrogen. So uh, you can in fact stabilize the coordination frameworks very effectively by using these uh, multinuclear metal nodes and we've done a lot of this work here uh, very successfully and I su suspect that quite a few of you are very familiar with this. You can make six connected systems which give rise to the alpha polonium structure or in fact you can have four connected systems which give rise to niobium oxide type structures. These are all based on uh, di-carboxylic uh, acids like terephthalic acid. So one of the experiments that we did with um, Jomwa was to make these sort of compounds and you can see that they are in fact very uh, open compounds and they have enormous pores and the question then arises can we use this void space to store hydrogen? Can we store dihydrogen in these systems? And uh, of course uh, that would then lead to the um, uh, hydrogen economy uh, or assist in the, in the movement towards the hydrogen economy and indeed uh, Jomwa did some excellent work and she showed that uh, these materials would adsorb dinitrogen, dihydrogen and then there's been a lot more work carried out uh, within the department over the last three or four years, some excellent work uh, that has uh, pushed the amount of hydrogen that can be absorbed more and more uh, effectively. <coughs> so there's the sort of, we're coming towards the end, we come towards 19, 2009 years now, isn't it? And I suppose that I'd like to finish so just with some acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to acknowledge everybody, of course, that I've been involved with here, and it's an enormous number of people, a uh, tremendous number, and I've, uh, I consider them all to be very much my friends. Um, they've been colleagues, they've been students, and some are here now, some have gone, and really uh, I've been very fortunate to have lived through this last 40 years here at Nottingham and met so many good friends. But I think there's one person that I need to mention in particular, and that's uh, my wife. Because without my wife, you know, it would have been very difficult to carry out all these, uh, not actually in the lab, but the support that you get it, it has been absolutely enormous. That's us on our wedding day, a long, long time ago, 1969. And then 40 years later, um, there we are on, uh, on a Costa ship in the middle of the South China Sea celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. So it's uh, very much uh, thanks to everybody that I've been involved with now, present and, uh, and past, and to my missus. Thank you. Well, Pete, you're a hard act to follow, <laughs> um, and uh, I will do my best. You, you've heard my uh, CV, and what I wanted to do was uh, indicate just a little bit of, of background to that and, and why 50 years on. You can do the arithmetic, of course, and see uh, that it was 50 years since I applied to come to Nottingham. And I came in January, uh, in fact, in 1960, after the application, to take the entrance exams. And uh, I came to this site, and the, the sort of science area on the campus was just emerging. And this chemistry building was almost constructed. And what impressed me 
uh, was the commitment of Nottingham to science at that time. So when they offered me a place, uh, I said, yes, I I'm going to come. So uh, dating me and obviously, obviously this building, I was in the first generation of students to occupy uh, this building. And uh, as has been said, I BSc, PhD. Uh, I'll say a little bit about uh, both PhD and postdoc with, with Harry Gray. I uh, came back here as an ICI research fellow because uh, Cliff Addison visited me while I was in California. And you may recall there was a wave of expansion in universities in the 60s. And I was complacent, thinking I could get an academic job whenever I wanted to. But Cliff, who was uh, a great mentor, said, no, if you want one, you better come back now because the door's closing. So uh, he arranged for this ICI research fellowship. And from here, I, I then looked around. And my home is Manchester, and so I was very happy to go to Manchester and stay there a long time. And it wasn't that I was unhappy, but I wanted to explore other possibilities in terms of not getting involved in too much administration uh, and Nottingham welcomed me back. So I was very pleased uh, to come back here in 99. Cliff, you've already seen and uh, you've heard the reasons for his interest uh, in um, liquid metals and also uh, N204. N204 is a powerful oxidant and the US Air Force was using it as a rocket propellant. And so uh, that was one of the reasons to look at the properties of N204. And I mention that in the context of what I'll try and say at the end of, of my, my talk, in that there is concern about how research is being funded in this present age. And I'm trying to point out that in the past there was always an applied element uh, coming in, whether it was the US Air Force or the Atomic Energy Authority. Uh, however, uh, we were left with academic freedom to pursue uh, the research that the professor uh, thought was relevant. As Pete indicated, and I'm not going to take you through quite the detail that, that, that he did, uh, both of these uh, non-aqueous solvents presented significant experimental challenges. I was involved using N204 and in the end I was making new nitrato complexes. However, as uh, Pete indicated, the professor decreed the uh, project to begin with and Cliff said, I want you to look at the conductivity of various ratios of N204 and DMSO. DMSO promotes the self-ionization of N204 into NO plus and NO3 minus and he wanted to control that. And this required absolutely anhydrous conditions. Uh, I found this very tedious, boredom set in, and probably psychosomatic, but I developed an allergic response to DMSO and broke out in all sorts of a rash. And that might have been one thing, but I think actually what made Cliff Addison's mind to take me off the project was Cliff was a tutor in Workley. And he got to Workley for lunch and walked down the hill. And this one particular day, he came down the hill and a huge cloud of N204 emanated from the building. Now, the reaction had run away and the fume cover fortunately removed it from the lab. And so Cliff uh, came in to check I was all right, etc. and I was. And then the following day, he said, hmm, I think we'd better look at another project for you. Uh, but what was interesting, he said, look, uh, this is Friday, Monday, come back and tell me what you want to do. And that was a wake-up call, because uh, the professor was omniscient, he knew all about inorganic chemistry. Uh, I had to think about it. And it took me a little longer than the weekend, but what interested me was use of physical methods. And Derek Sutton, who was in the department, was using infrared spectroscopy combined with our new... Uh, Raman spectroscopy, not the laser Raman spectroscopy you've got today, and group theory. And I've underlined group theory because group theory was new. This mathematical logic uh, was quite challenging to us. Of course, once you got to be able to use group theory, then it was very powerful. And Derek was trying to determine uh, the structure of nitrato complexes using that combination and the analysis from group theory because nitrate with three oxygens combined with one, two, or, or three uh, bonded to a metal. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I j thought I'd join him. However, uh, I did do a fair amount of reading, uh, and that's another way, of course, of picking up ideas in addition, in addition to listening and talking to colleagues, as <laughs> Pete's indicated. Uh, X-ray crystallography had been around for, for some time, of course, from the days of Bragg. Uh, I'll show you one or two 
sort of Nobel Prize is to set another context, and you see Dorothy Hodgkin had got a Nobel Prize before uh, I really got involved in, in, in this work. It's eight coordinates, and you can see each nitrate has two oxygens pointing to the metal. And that led me on to being interested in eight coordinate structures and, and various sort of uh, electronic effects that came from the, the different geometries because tetrahedral and octahedral were, were well known, but eight coordinate were not. So one thing, as it were, leads to another. Then I went to, to Harry Gray in Caltech, and that was an inspirational experience. Uh, Harry, as you'll see, is a jovial, outgoing character, still very much involved in chemistry today. And what I did with, with Harry was completely different. Now, that's me as a young person. That's the only picture you're going to see of me uh, today outside the, the new Beckman Auditorium at Caltech. Uh, Beckman, the spectroscopist and manufacturer of spectroscopic instrumentation, has been a, a, a benefactor of Caltech, and they named this uh, auditorium after him. And what Harry wanted to do was use low-temperature UV visible spectroscopy and look at ions such as COCl4 2 minus in matrices where unlike uh, lattices where if we look at uh, crystals then unless you're very fortunate the iron doesn't retain its full symmetry its TD symmetry and so what we were able to show is with the right choice of the non-aqueous mixed solvent uh, as a glass down to low temperature, we could get a regular geometry. Now, it was fairly straightforward, but it was the first time several ions such as this had been seen spectroscopically in that sort of environment. But the, the bonus was the people around me. At Caltech, I was in contact with a range of very able researchers. Ed Stiefel uh, was a lifelong friend until tragically he died some 18 months ago. He was completing his PhD with Harry he was still based at Columbia because Harry had just moved to Caltech from Columbia when I got there. And Ed called in from time to time and I got to know him socially. And he was studying dithiolene complexes, a fascinating subject at the time and that stayed with me, although it was a while before I got re-engaged with, with that topic. I went to, to Manchester and I was very fortunate in, in many ways, partly the era where I had the luxury of taking some time before choosing my research project. Uh, young lecturers today have got more pressure than I had. Uh, but a mentor is vital. And for some reason, John Baxendale, who was a reader in physical chemistry, who did uh, fast kinetic experiments, uh, but mainly using solvated electrons, uh, and we had nothing in common research-wise, but over coffee cups, he, he talked to me. And his advice was, pick a good problem and get your head down. And the first phase of research uh, was with Frank Mabs, lifelong friend. And following the work with Harry, I thought I knew everything about electronic structure of detransition metal complexes. Five minutes with Frank told me I didn't. Uh, he is a master of, of, of that area, understated and, I think, un under-recognized. Uh, and so I linked in with him, learnt a lot. Then, uh, in terms of, again, reading and trying to take a wide view of the literature, I wrote a review for the Royal Society of Chemistry on early transition metal chemistry. And I read that molybdenum was the catalytic centre of the nitrate reductase enzymes. I thought, fine, I I'm uh, an inorganic chemist, I know about nitrate complexes, metals and so on, uh, I can sort this out. Uh, and so I got involved through molybdenum enzymes into the field of biological inorganic chemistry which was just starting and uh, had a role in a whole range of aspects and this is shown uh, because uh, I spent a lot of time within Europe politicking and then we set up with a uh, larger than life Italian Ivano Bettini uh, the uh, Society of Biological Inorganic Chemistry ESPIC and we decided to have uh, as our logo something bold and this is uh, the birth of Venus by Botticelli and it fits it's bringing inorganic chemistry to life here's the shell and life coming out of it and you can read whatever you want to in the uh, other sort of figures in in the picture what was interesting 
was uh, several vocal American females who were in the society objected to this as a logo. Until we had a conference in Florence and they went round the Uffizi Museum and saw that this was a work of art, in which case it was okay and we could, we could adopt it. We also had the ploy of making one of them president and, and so she uh, enjoyed that uh, as well. In terms of, again, looking to develop biological and organic chemistry, I became aware through really contacts in the physics department at Manchester that X-ray absorption spectroscopy was coming in as a powerful technique thanks to the use of synchrotrons and synchrotron radiation. Synchrotrons are large devices, uh, large constructions that move electrons around a field at the speed of light and they emit radiation uh, tangential to that motion and you can get very intense sources of x-rays and other wavelengths and it allows you to probe trace amounts of metals in biological systems and other materials and they started at Stanford Keith Hodson in using this technique to look at metal centers uh, in biological systems initially my studies were undertaken at Hamburg and I enjoyed uh, visiting Hamburg uh, and then uh, moved to Daresbury when the new synchrotron uh, was built. This was the UK's first synchrotron. Uh, the second diamond, of course, uh, is now near Oxford. And uh, this was exhilarating in terms of the interdisciplinarity. You needed the biologists to make the materials, you needed the physicists to tell you how to make the measurements and at times to do the interpretation. And the precision of protein crystallography was poor. In other words, if you wanted to see the details of the coordination sphere of a metal atom in a metalloprotein, you couldn't really get it at the start of the 80s from protein crystallography. And was, so there was a logic, and I had a role. You record the X-ray absorption spectrum of a metalloprotein together with that of a set of structurally characterized model compounds. You usually had some idea about what would be the coordination sphere in uh, a particular metalloprotein, and you could make a, a range of model compounds. And then you use the information, the spectra from the model compounds, to calibrate that of the former. Okay, it's a sporting method, but it did take us a long way in understanding uh, the nature of a range of metal centers. Some systems were easy, some were challenging. But after about 10 years, our studies were overtaken by advances in protein crystallography. In other words, protein crystallography gave the full picture uh, with a resolution that in the end uh, we couldn't match. And so this is chicken liver sulfide oxidase, one of the molybdenum enzymes that's been uh, something I've been very concerned about for a long time. Uh, and what you see is, is this beautiful resolution in terms of uh, the coordination sphere and uh, this particular ligand uh, which is Freya knows perhaps to a cost, uh, this is still a passion as to how this particular cofactor uh, functions within uh, these enzymes. And this is the cofactor and, and it's multifaceted with this terrin, this pyran ring and a dithylene. And the dithylene is vital. Dick Holm, uh, a rival but a very good friend, has done a lot of chemistry suggesting uh, that this other these other functionalities complement the metal dithylene chemistry. We think part of that is important, uh, and Freya's work is, is developing that. In terms of looking ahead now, 50 years on, that was part of my title, looking back. Uh, I'm 50 years on since initially I thought I might come here. But looking ahead, what I want to do is put up a little bit of a perspective in terms of changes I've seen and now through my role with the raw side of chemistry, some of the messages I'm trying to get across. One thing that often is forgotten is when I commenced studies at Nottingham, it was rare to find that inorganic chemistry had an equal status with physical and organic in both teaching and research. Nottingham was rare. I didn't appreciate that when I first came. I did when I left. Now, of course, for the last, say, 30 years, this has been the norm. Inorganic chemistry, and I'm very clear, it's the chemistry of all the elements, I certainly include carbon, the steel Adele, and many others of you will do, it's flourished during the last 50 years in a whole host of respects and shows no signs of abating. I'm very optimistic about the future of what we call inorganic chemistry. 
This is, of course, a slide you should never show, but what I wanted to do is highlight developments in chemistry related to what I'm calling inorganic during my lifetime. And one way of doing it is just to look where the ultimate recognition, as it were, was given. But I do like George Bernard Shaw's comment of the Nobel Prize, it's a life belt given to a drowning man after he's reached the shore. In other words, the Nobel Committee is very conservative and wants to be sure uh, that the science is sound. Whereas Alfred Nobel, if you read his original idea, it was to give it to promising researchers so they'd have financial independence and could do the experiments they wanted to do. However, it's become too important for that. Catalysis uh, is vital uh, that we're still exploring uh, new catalysts. They're vital in a whole range of uh, reactions, not least organic synthesis, but of course in terms of environmental control. Fullerenes marking the recognition uh, of nanoscience. We've had nanoscience ar around for a long time, but, but this punctuated uh, the, the um, sort of landscape by, by uh, recognizing an important molecule in that sense and putting things into perspective. Henry Tauby did some marvellous work on reactions of metal complexes. I always felt Joe Chat, uh, our English coordination chemist, really should have been recognised uh, for his elegant work alongside Tauby. Uh, Bill Lipscomb for studies of boranes, uh, and again, uh, in terms of recognition, Ken Wade at Durham, who put Wade's rules together so that we understood all of that, deserves this sort of recognition. Uh, E.O. Fisher and Jeff Wilkinson for pioneering a huge development uh, in my lifetime of organometallic chemistry, uh, noting the, the starting of the sandwich compounds, but of course extended beyond that. Underpinning all of our chemistry, I'll come back to it, and I could have picked other citations, Robert Mulliken for the fundamental work concerning electronic structure of molecules. And as I indicated, my contributions to X-ray crystallography pale into insignificance when you look, Dorothy Hodgkin was recognised in 64 for the B12 uh, structure uh, with cobalt at the centre. So that gives you a sort of perspective of how chemistry has developed during my lifetime, particularly the inorganic side. In terms of looking back a little bit, clearly inorganic chemistry has been facilitated by developments in physical methodology. So when you make a new compound, you can get a mass spectrum, you can get uh, high resolution X-ray crystallography, NMR as right, uh, you can do a range of measurements, not least EPR if it's paramagnetic, theoretical calculations to understand the system. I've clearly missed out a lot of techniques, I didn't want to bore you with all of those. But the range of tools now available to characterise inorganic systems uh, is prolific and we finish up with a lot of information. But also there's the simulation of the significance. The inorganic chemistry is vital for the development of new catalysts, new materials, in my area, understanding the chemistry of life, but also many new and important pharmaceutical products come out of inorganic chemistry. <clears throat> if we look at chemistry in the 21st century, then the trend is for chemistry research to be increasingly interdisciplinary. We can look at biochemistry, catalysis, environmental science, material science, medical diagnosis, nanotechnology, surface science. There's a da danger we get to what I call the donut effect. We have all of this going at the periphery. We must ensure that the strength of core chemistry is retained. And my, if we look at wither chemistry, there's a pun intended. Is chemistry going to wither or wh where is it going? I think we have to address Einstein's criticism. The trouble with chemistry is it's too difficult for chemists. And what he's meaning by that, I take it, is... It's an experimental science, we accept that. But in order to make, let's say, a new drug molecule or, or to determine how to make a particular, let's say, material, we have to experiment. I'm not sure we're going to go away from that, but we need to maintain that while understanding, in particular, the electronic structure of molecules and materials to allow a fundamental understanding of their properties and reactions. We're still at a stage and I'm going to be a little bit rude to the organic chemists, of using bows and arrows to, to indicate how bonds make and break. We've got to get past that stage. 
One disappointment is that, and I've been involved in, in some studies, notably with Claire Wilson, synchrotron radiation should give us direct measurements of electronic structure of molecules. In other words, looking at the non-spherical density of electrons around atoms. So far, that's not, not routine. We do rely on uh, theoretical calculations, which are very powerful, but I do like to calibrate things with evidence. And this will happen, and I hope happen fairly soon. Now, my political bit, which I can see go around the world talking about, is to convince politicians of the role of chemistry in the future. And, of course, one aspect is where we are and the challenges of the 21st century. So I've called it Global Challenges, Chemical Solutions. And the perspective, of course, is, is this. We face major challenges in respect of the sustainability of life on this planet. If we look at the present situation, with about 6 billion people, we're expecting about 8 billion in the foreseeable future. And coupled to that, there's an expectancy that the quality of life will improve for all peoples of this planet. Nobody's content with, with the status quo. Even my standard of living has increased dramatically over the last 50, 60 years. I still expect more. RSC have comp completed a roadmap uh, indi to indicate where we're going, but in particular, the role of the chemical sciences in the pursuit of sustainable development, providing technological solutions to the challenges we face. And it's very much trying to get up to the politicians, indicating that they can't have the progress they want without chemistry. And what we can look at is the provision of secure, affordable and sustainable sources of energy. We need to manage air and water quality. We need food security. And governments actually have latched onto this now in terms of making plans for the future, but they're looking at it too much in isolation. We need to look at sustainable sources of feedstocks for the uh, various manufacturing industries, and in particular improve recycling. And of course, we're interested in disease prevention and the maintenance of human health. Also, lifestyle, we want to be personally fulfilling, but also sustainable. And then when we look at the urban development that's taking place in various parts of the world, cities do need to meet the requirement of their citizens, but within this context of making sure that life is sustainable. A key aspect from my perspective is photosynthesis. And note the amount of energy we have available. In one hour, the amount of light energy falling on the Earth is about equivalent to the annual power consumption of all human civilization. The energy is there. We're just very poor at tapping into it. So I'd like to see developments. They are happening, but they need to accelerate. But what is being missed out, and we're lobbying the government on this, is the other side of photosynthesis, is you can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Trees and Plants do this very efficiently, and they produce something that is chemically useful. And I'd like to put this much more uh, as a challenge for chemists to not only tap into the sunlight, but also to use it to remove CO2. And what, following that line, much of the life on planet Earth depends on photosynthesis, directly or indirectly, as a source of energy, and the carbon reduction is enormous, about 10 to the 11 tonnes of carbon per biomass per year. There's another reason for removing CO2 beyond the one we're normally, normally talking about in terms of uh, the um, melting of the polar ice caps, and that's the incre increasing acidity of the oceans. So in addition to seeing the polar ice caps disappear, we're seeing marine life cycles uh, being interrupted because of the acidity caused by the increased CO2 in the atmosphere. And then, uh, just an illustration of where uh, chemistry, and I can relate it to inorganic chemistry, in that many of the contrast agents used in molecular uh, resonance imaging uh, do involve uh, inorganic elements. And so chemistry has a vital role in all of that. And, of course, you can see this is a political slogan. My son's based in Tokyo, so he supplied this photograph to me. 
uh, and for the politicians, but also to you. Let's use chemistry to maintain uh, a life of beauty and quality. And one way we're starting is that UNESCO have dubbed 2011 as the International Year of Chemistry. Now, what I've tried to do is take you on a whistle-stop tour. Uh, the various influences in my professional life, as Pete's indicated, I, like Pete, owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to all the people uh, with which I've been associated. Some uh, I've had um, sort of disputes with, as happens in, in life, uh, but if you are civilised, fight your corner well, then that also turns out to be a strength. But mainly, uh, it's friends in chemistry, research students, uh, and I've not, as it were, given them credit for all the work that they have done. It's the, the research students that have done the work that I've benefited from, uh, and uh, also the friendship and the very sort of positive life, but above all the fun that, that comes from this life, I, I feel extremely grateful. So I thank all of them, and I thank you for bearing with us today. Thank you.